I'm sure you know about the academy. Yeah, sure. You know about the National yes, Academy of Guerrero yes. Sanchez. So, and also, you are also familiar with National Academy of Guerrero oh, Sanchez. Oh, yes, sir. We have a similar <laughs> setup. Friends, good afternoon. May I request you all to kindly take your seats, please? Um, Honorable President of the Academy, Dr. Himanshu Patak, the Director General of the Indian Council of Agricultural Research, and the Secretary of the Department of Agricultural Research, Education, Government of India, the invited speakers, Dr. William Dar, Dr. Ajay Kohli, Professor Rajiv Warshne, the Foreign Secretary of the Academy, Dr. Lakra will be joining a little later, the Secretary of the Academy, all the esteemed fellowship, It's an honor for me to welcome you all to this particular session. And I have pleasure in welcoming Dr. Himanshu Patak, a well noted scientist in the area of climate change, as you all know, the president of the Academy. I have a pleasure in welcoming to this particular session the both speakers of this special evening lectures. Dr. William Durr, whom you all know, I'm sure, worked for a long time in India as Director General of the ICRISET. Currently, he's based in Philippines, and he happens to be the global advisor of the Prasad Seeds Limited, operating both in India and Philippines. We welcome you, Dr. Willie Durr, for sparing your very valuable time, and also to agree, give this special evening lecture. I extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Ajay Kohli, Another very familiar household name for us, a wonderful rice researcher. Uh, for many years, he's been working outside India and contributing also to Indian agriculture. I extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Ajay Kohli, the Deputy Director of General Research of IRI from Manila. Welcome you, Dr. Kohli. I also welcome, have this honor of welcoming our own of the Academy's Foreign Secretary, uh, Professor Rajiv Warshne, who also had long stint, you know, as you all know, again in Ikriset, and now he's working in Murdoch University and has got various hats, you know, and particularly the director of the State Biotechnology Center there, you know, in Murdoch. Extend a very warm welcome to all of you. And I also welcome on behalf of the Academy, all of our very senior fellowship, and they're all here, our immediate past president, or not immediate, sorry, uh, our former past president, Professor Dr. R.B. Singh, Dr. P.L. Gotham, Dr. Uh, Dr. Sidi Mai Sahab, and all other senior colleagues who are present here, Director of IRI, Professor Ashok Singh, Dr. D.K. Yadav, the ADG seed, and very many senior colleagues, Dr. T.R. Sharma, DDG Crop Sciences, and our Honorable Vice Presidents. Both of them are I here, Dr. Bajor Barua and Dr. Anil Singh. I welcome you all again, and also our members of the Executive Council. We have editor, Dr. Malvika Dadlani, and all others, members of the Executive Council and, and senior fellowship. It's, it's a pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of the Academy to this new series of lectures which are being initiated and for which not only I welcome our honorable president of the Academy and I in fact thank him for giving this opportunity to the Academy, to the fellowship and to all directors, the scientists, faculty 
of the various ICR institutes and agriculture universities around the country we have. Because as you all know, this program is being live streamed through YouTube. And as well as, of course, those who have joined us online, I welcome them as well through Zoom link. So it's a great pleasure for us friends today at the eve of the celebration of our Foundation Day, which is tomorrow on 5th June uh, of 2023. It's a great honor and pleasure for me um, to invite you all and welcome you to this particular evening session, which is again a very special session you know, before, uh, before the dinner. And we have very happy that two of the speakers, learned speakers, internationally renowned scientists agreed for this. And to further introduce them, I would request now uh, Dr. Professor Raji Warshne um, to introduce the speakers and followed by their presentation. So I request Professor Raji Warshne to introduce the speakers, please. Professor Raji Warshne. And thank you all again, friends, for joining. Welcome you once again. Professor Raji Warshne. Thank you, Professor Bansal. And a very good evening to everyone. Let me recognize the presence of our president, Dr. Himan Supatak, and also the secretary there and DGICR, and our two eminent speakers who are on the dais, Dr. William Dar, Dr. Ajay Kohli, and secretary, Professor K.C. Vansal, and also Dr. Vajir Lakra. In addition to that, I would like to welcome all that executive council member, especially the vice president, Dr. Vujur Varua and Dr. Anil Singh, Dr. Malvika Dadlani, and all the EC members. Here, also would like to recognize the presence of very senior colleagues, including Dr. R.V. Singh, Dr. Gautam, Dr. Mai, and many senior officer, officials from ICR, including DDG Crop Science, Dr. T.R. Sharma, Dr. J.K. Janad, DDG Fisheries, as well as DDG Education, Dr. Agrawal, and also many friends, well wishers, including Dr. A.K. Singh, Director ICR IRI, Dr. D.K. Yadav ADGs, and many other ADGs, and also the directors of several ICR institutes, vice chancellors of various SAUs, and uh, all senior esteemed fellowship. So it's really a great pleasure for me to introduce today's speakers. And here, first, I would like to introduce Dr. William Dar. And I think this is really a privilege and honor for me to introduce Dr. Dar, who has been Director General of ICRISAT for many, many years, but also at the personal front, he is the one who appointed me at ICRISAT and not only appointed, but also empowered me. And so, and since then, he has been my mentor and well wishers. Dr. Dar name is known to everybody. But here, I would like to mention very briefly, he is right now the president of Inang Lupa movement. And as we know, he has been the director general for ICRISAT for 15 years and secretary for agriculture for two times for the Ministry of Agriculture in Philippines. Dr. Dar is a champion of the poor, especially the small older farmers, fisher folks, and agripreneurs. His servant leadership guided by solid and news principles of food security has been bestowed laurels such as the first MS Swaminathan Global Leadership Award for the Sustainable Development 2022 given by the Indian Chamber of Food and Agriculture last November in 2022 in New Delhi. Lifetime Achievers Award during the Asia Leaders Award 2020. Lifetime Contributors Award by the Asia CEO, CEO Awards and presidential awards accorded by the University of the Philippines, Las Vinos, El Munai Association. And there are many other recognition. I don't have, would not like to speak everything, but briefly in 1998, he was recognized as one of the 10 outstanding young men of the Philippines. And in 2016, Dr. Dar received the outstanding Filipino award in cognizance of his servant leadership, which was instrumental in transforming ICRISAT from a struggling institute to one of the top performing centers of the CGR. In 15 years of outstanding achievements as DG of ICRISAT, he championed and institutionalized an overarching strategy called I-Mode. And according to that, the farmers became active participants for their own welfare. Also during his first tenure as that Secretary of Agriculture in Philippines, I think the Philippine agriculture achieved a remarkable 9.6% growth, which has never been achieved until today. And under the second tenure as a secretaryship in Philippines, 
He transformed the Philippine agriculture through the one day reform agenda with four major pillars consolidation, modernization, industrialization, and professionalization. And many of us are also aware that under his leadership, golden rice has also become commercialized in the Philippines. So, with these few words, we would like to invite Dr. Dar. So, please join me in welcoming him. And we would like to invite Dr. Dar. For Thank you, Dr. Rajib Barsney, for the very kind introduction. Rajib is a loss to Iqlisat, but the gain of the world. Has gone to Australia to become the director of the uh, Center for Crops and uh, Food Innovation at Mordok University. Thanks again for this introduction. To the, let me greet the, the president of the National Academy for Agricultural Sciences, Dr. Himanshu Patak, and of course, also as Director General of Indian Council for Agricultural Research. The secretary, one of the secretaries of NAS, Professor Casey Bansal, Dr. Ajay Kohli, DDG Iri, again, Dr. Rajib Bursney of Mordok University. I see here friends from the previous engagements, Dr. Swapan Data, Dr. Arbi Singh, Dr. Aki Singh, and many of you whom I cannot name today. Again, it's uh, such a pleasure to be back here in India, in New Delhi. I was here last year during, again, in this hall, receiving the uh, Leadership Award for Sustainable Development. So I really find India as my second home. So thank you always for welcoming me to India. Maybe I have said before in a number of four already that uh, my history, uh, family history, Dar comes from India, and maybe that's how I love to work in India, having been Director General of Ikrisat for 15 years. And so here I come every now and then to really continue to share knowledge and experiences with you, uh, much more to the very illust illustrious members of the National Academy for Agricultural Sciences. So the other officials of NAS, the members of the National Academy for Agricultural Sciences, friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'll be discussing with you this uh, topic, regenerative agriculture, feeding and sustaining the world. As the COVID-19 pandemic winds down into a non-emergency, I take the occasion to sustain some of our urgency. Over the three years, we have had to push several panic buttons over the global health crisis, foremost, the desperate clamor to abide by climate change commitments never quite left. And we continue to fret about food insecurity, the fallout from the three C's I mentioned, COVID-19, climate change, and conflicts aggravated our worries. A radical shift in our methods puts us back on track for sustainable food production and shakes up agriculture as we know it. In the age of artificial intelligence, the scientific 
imagination for food security must also take flight. Technology has shown to be limitless. We can stretch the imagination to achieve sustainable food systems. Regenerative agriculture is an evolved concept. Its core is the sustainability of global food production well into feeding the future generations. But its objective has expanded. These days, we want food production to stand shoulder to shoulder with the environmental and ecological imperative. Climate change and the nationally declared commitments of each country during the recent climate change conference in Egypt, intensified calls for ecological conservation. Hence, it is pretty much in vogue for regenerative agriculture to be called agroecological agriculture or nature-based agriculture. As the agriculture sector is one of the leading emitters of greenhouse gases. It has to fully come into a leadership role in transitioning from its polluting and earth degrading methods. Agriculture has been responsible for large scale deforestation, the siphoning of freshwater sources towards irrigation and biodiversity loss. It can be noted that the countries with the most industrialized farming systems were the first to know the consequences of intensive chemical-based monocropping. They have seen parched lands, polluted water sources, and depleted soils, which are less and less productive every cycle. The overhaul of our food systems now relies on the basics of soil enhancement, the management of water resources, and improving and increasing biodiversity. It's not a reversal, which is impossible. It is regeneration or rebirth. Regenerative agriculture is not merely a benign method of farming, it actively contributes to the improvement of our natural environments and resources. It now benefits from advancements in technology. There are fears, however, that recent inventions and disruptions in farming could be antithetical to our sustainability drive. These fears could be unfounded. To date, precision agriculture and molecular breeding have addressed both food security and biodiversity without reports of significant harm. These disruptive technologies challenge the stretches of imagination on what regenerative agriculture can accomplish and the extent of the methods at our disposal. New developments prove our creative and scientific latitude with it. What has become clear is that soil health, water and energy security will be keys to making regenerative agriculture work. Climate science and economics now widely accept that green living will require large investments in water conservation and the transition to renewables. This task runs the gamut of avoiding waste and providing the infrastructure to implement renewable energy transitions. Furthermore, regenerative agriculture is conducive to current practices in green economies, carbon trading systems, in which carbon credits could be secured from activities such as reforestation and forest conservation 
pine portage in this model. Greenhouse farming and precision agriculture promise to work with data science and digital technology to optimize resource use, especially with regard to water and energy. Our ability to process large data sets in the digital age permits a thorough monitoring of agriculture's resource consumption. The current technological order complements the core principles of regenerative agriculture. At its core, regenerative agriculture is all about promoting soil and water health and adapting sustainable farming practices. Much research has shown that this regenerative agriculture leads to higher yields and a re-flourishing of planetary biodiversity. Microbiomes of the soil can be enhanced and enlivened through the introduction of carbon trapping microbials. This method has long been considered a counterfoil to the nutrient sapping effects of excessive chemical fertilizer and pesticide use. With the diminution of arable land and the world over, soil enhancement and restoration through microorganisms is being advanced to strengthen soil systems bogged down by decades of industrialized farming. The role of microorganisms in improving crop production is increasingly studied here in India alone, where the food security imperative is to feed the largest population base of the world. Research is advancing on the deployment of microbes in the soil to reduce dependence on chemical pesticides and fertilizers. The idea plays up the natural symbiosis between plants and microbes and focuses on the carbon trapping mechanisms involved by the microorganisms. This also mitigates climate change, of course. The Ukraine-Russia war exposed our heavy dependence on imported chemical fertilizers for most of the developing countries. Thankfully, this has triggered a movement and openness towards balanced fertilization, the more feasible road toward organic farming, which is yet to prove its scalability. The use of biofertilizers alongside inorganic fertilizers goes a long way in easing the cost burdens of small farmers. At the same time, it introduces circularity in food systems by recycling organic waste into a food production input. Secondly, the role of clean water in agriculture has become an urgent concern. It must be noted that marine ecosystems are also significant food baskets. To date, these marine ecosystems are severely damaged and also require the intervention of regenerative agriculture. Regenerative ocean farming is also then being put forward for the creation of blue-green economies, prevent coastal erosion, and further damage to marine ecosystems and promote resiliency in coastal communities. 70% of the world's press water has been consecrated to agriculture. As long as we are on the drive towards healthy soils, we must clean up remaining water sources to achieve the water retention optimum of soils. And it is the small farmers who can replicate these systems and make them feasible. The age old worry is whether or not the yields from this noble regenerative methods could indeed feed the world. What with 345 million people facing food insecurity so far in 2023. 
Some models are encouraging. Community farms in Andhra were reported to have much higher yields through natural farming than conventional farming. These natural farming systems integrate microbial seed treatment and microbial inoculation along with biomass use and crop diversification to maximize soil health. On the consumer end too, regenerative agriculture is gaining support. Trade practices among developed countries increasingly favor organic produce with strict controls on chemical pesticide and fertilizer use in the production of raw materials. In time, produce from developing agricultural economies must shape up to fulfill this global health demand. It would be nearly impossible to implement regenerative agriculture practices across the board without full support for small farmers. They are the first link absorbing such an upheaval throughout the food system and even in the most localized supply chains. Thus, the diffusion of regenerative technologies must foremost appeal to smallholders' moral and economic positions vis-a-vis -vis the environment. Understand that it is cheaper and more reassuring for many of them right now to simply resort to time-worn chemical inputs. Because of that, that, because that's the way they have always done things before. We have to convince them to go against tradition. Hence, governments, civil society, and research organizations must spread the most compelling gospel of regenerative agriculture, which is that it spares smallholders too much expense from costly inputs. And from a moral standpoint, it puts our farmers back in contact with nature and the timeless symbiotes their livelihood has with the environment. Once we cascade the benefits of regenerative agriculture to small farming households, which remain the basic social units of agriculture, only then can we say that we have advanced in this movement. Thus, the targeted diffusion of know-how in regenerative methods must enjoin two of the most influential decision makers in agriculture today, the youth and women. Such demographics have been shown to be receptive to disruptive technologies, especially as the new generational ethos in food production and consumption has supplanted old industrial models. The youth, which are today's entrepreneurs, are purveyors of this model and all its associated knowledge, which means that science and technology inputs in regenerative agriculture must be made accessible to them and vice versa. Our young ones must have the capacity to understand agroecological possibilities a proactive measure towards its normalization in future generations is the integration of its application in basic and tertiary education curricula. This will provide the room for talent and capabilities in science and technology to flourish and be channeled towards this new food security frontier. In time, I hope we are on the road to the normalization of regenerative agriculture in assuring global food security and eradicating hunger once and for all. I am confident this body of eager, break the mold scientific minds, sees the way forward with these proposals. And I hope the scientists here today 
the members of the National Academy for Agricultural Sciences can influence our respective states or the whole of India and other countries of the world to follow suit. Now the task ahead of us involves pushing not only knowledge, but the adoption of regenerative technologies in national development agendas. Our knowledge and expertise behove us to advocate for country level policy direction and commitment. This must be brought out in concrete documents and declarations of national resolve to pursue regenerative agriculture. Thank you and may nature's bounty inspire all of us further. Thank you very much, sir, for very impressive presentation. You introduced and highlighted the importance of regenerative agriculture and also not only for enhancing the yield, but also promoting the biodiversity, soil health, and many other areas you covered. And I think as you mentioned that even this is going to be very helpful for smallholder farmers. And you also highlighted that inclusive approach having the youth and women to promote this particular area. So I think uh, with many other areas, I'm not going to repeat, but I'm sure that with your experience and with this presentation, our fellowships is heavily benefited. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation and delivering very great presentation. So please join me in congratulating Dr. Dar once again. Now I would like to introduce our next speaker and he's from International Rice Research Institute. When we talk about rice, we always remember that remarkable contribution of Dr. Shopan Datta in rice, rice biotechnology, and many other technologies in research as a former DDG crop science, and also in education as the former vice chancellor of two universities. So thank you very much, Dr. Datta. Now I would like to mention about Dr. Ajay Kohli. So let me get my paper from here, sorry about that. Yes. Dr. Ajay Kohli is the Deputy Director General Research at International Rice Research Institute at present, and he is leading that rich research quality and delivery strategy to meet the needs and expectations of donors, investors, partners, and stakeholders. Dr. Kohli has been a great scientist as well, and before directorship roles, he led a rich strategic innovation platform where he supervised a team of 15 international scientists and almost 100 staff members primarily in the application of fundamental uh, sciences such as genomics, genetics, and bioinformatics instruments. His platform identified genes and provided genetic materials and associated information enabling the institute's rice breeders and physiologists to harness upstream research into translational research through a highly interdisciplinary approach. Dr. Kohli also led a rich plant molecular biology group for about 10 years. And under his leadership, the group gained recognition in the gene discovery and characterization in environmental stress tolerance of rice, particularly improving yield under drought conditions. And like Dr. Dar, Dr. Kohli's research is also very much integrated with our Indian agriculture research system. So would like to invite Dr. Kohli, please join me in welcoming Dr. Kohli for this presentation, please. This one, yeah. Thank you, Rajiv. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I have to say uh, a big thank you to the National Academy for inducting me as a fellow. At least now I have something to add next to my name. So <laughs> I've, I've um, not won any awards, uh, and not uh, won many titles, uh, just been doing my job mostly as a scientist 
and uh, recently uh, in uh, uh, managerial and leadership positions at ERI. Um, <clears throat> this is going to be a little different. Um, in 1973, there was a movie from Bollywood. It was called Sadagar. So there were two Sadagars. One was Amitabh Bachchan Sadagar and the other was Dilip Kumar and Rajkumar Sadagar. And when I came into this room and I'm sitting over here, um, I actually felt like Vivek Mushran. I don't know how many of you remember Vivek Mushran. <laughs> so, um, because there are so many Dilip Kumars and Raj Kumars sitting over here. Um, and um, I, I just, uh, despite the fact that I'm going to turn 60 in a couple of weeks, I just feel like, uh, you know, standing in front of uh, all the Dilip Kumars and Raj Kumars of agriculture. I think the reason for that <clears throat> is uh, something that Dr. Uh, R.B. Singh mentioned, um, because I come from the background of uh, basic sciences. And then for some time, I, I did my research uh, in India, um, ICGB, JNU, Indian Institute of Science, uh, so in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, whatever institutes were doing cutting edge research in molecular biology, I had stints over there, except I think CCMB. Um, so when I first left India in 1992, I went to Iri <clears throat> and uh, I went there for two and a half years. And um, I suddenly realized that the chip that I carried on my shoulder about being a cutting edge molecular biologist uh, would come to nothing if I was not connected to the breeders, to the agronomists, to the physiologists, to the pathologists, et cetera. So going back to you know, feeling like a boy in this uh, auditorium here, I want to recognize all the stalwarts sitting over here uh, who have taken agriculture, Indian agriculture, to where it is today. And it has come a very long way. So thank you very much. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Patak here, Dr. Bansal, Dr. Sharma, so many people I, I know, Dr. Arbi Singh. Um, I really feel like a boy over here in front of all of you because my time in agriculture has just been about 10 to 12 years. And I'm so glad that I got those 12 years in agriculture because as a basic scientist, molecular biologist, I wasn't really getting anywhere. But as soon as I started using that basic science towards agriculture, uh, life became totally different. So thank you very much for uh, inducting me in, in a, in a uh, elite, I would say, company. Because for me, <clears throat> agriculture is actually much bigger, much more challenging than I think most of the professional fields. Because unless you are connected all through the spectrum of agriculture, uh, you don't make much progress. And the progress has to be there because it's all about food. You know, wherever we go in technology, we are still be eating our food. And so we need that food to be produced in whatever way it is produced, either through AI or machine learning or whatever takes over, the food has to be produced. So for me, agriculture is the biggest profession, I think, that one could be involved in. So thank you. Let me good start with something <clears throat> that, uh, it could be a, a bit of a uh, issue here because I'm gonna talk about green revolution a little bit. And while we have known green revolution to be uh, the most useful aspect to have happened in the last 60 years or so, um, we have come to a point that we are realizing that not everything was right with green revolution. And so there are, there are glimpses that we are getting, uh, which we need to be mindful of. And, and if we are mindful of that, perhaps we can come up with some solutions as well. So what I'm trying to show over here is, is uh, that whatever technology comes in, uh, it has to be a balancing act between a bane or a boon. 
and we all know that with almost every technology, most recently the internet that we have seen can be a bane in many, many ways, but it can uh, also be a boon. And so when we take up a technology and we have a certain number of years where everything seems hunky-dory, you actually then have to start asking what else is happening and how we can tackle that. So in terms of green revolution for rice, as far as rice is concerned, um, yes, it was a, it was a major achievement. Uh, it still is a major achievement. Uh, it is a, it is something that saved humanity from, from famine, from starvation. Um, but we are now seeing that there were issues with that and we need to tackle those. I started thinking about these, these aspects uh, based on a particular QTL that, that we were, uh, that I was working with when I joined IRI again in my second stint as a scientist in 2008, September 2008. Um, and uh, the job was to really take up a QTL and fine map it and, and find a candidate gene for it. And this was a QTL for uh, yield under drought. And uh, just the common sense in me said, yield a complex trait. Uh, drought tolerance, a complex trait. Yield under drought, doubly complex trait. Can there be a single gene for that? And so I just mentioned that maybe we should look at recombinants within the QTL and see whether or not the QTL still has the same effect. Because then at least it will tell us whether which part of the QTL might be important. So what you see over here are two diagrams. <clears throat> One is uh, yield of the different lines. Um, and the other bit is the markers, the yellow marker, uh, the blue marker, they are from different, uh, the two different parents. So if you compare the two uh, diagrams, one under well-watered conditions shown by WW, the other by under drought stress conditions, if you go along or if you go down the well-watered conditions, what you see is there's a hodgepodge of blue and yellow and white. White is when we could not assign the marker to either parent. But if you go down to uh, the DS, which is drought stress, and, and uh, go down vertically, what you see is the last lane when the entire QTL comes from the donating parent, that's when you get the maximum yield. So it clearly showed that the entire QTL was actually important. What was interesting is that while the breeders were doing this work, uh, of course, we were also working with them at that time. We were also looking at some uh, genes that could be responsible. And, and we came up with about 12 genes which are dispersed all along the QTL. Nearly, uh, there were a few transcription factors there. And one of the transcription factor was NAM no apical meristem. And what I realized after looking at that was something that later on turned out into uh, a more known, well-known concept, which is the genetic bottleneck, is that the functional copy of this transcription factor was present only in high yielding irrigated lines. And so the question was, how come something that is useful for drought tolerance is actually present in lines that do not see drought much. They're all high yielding irrigated lines, elite lines. So that was the beginning of, of you know, starting to doubt about what happened during our almost obsession with yield, trying to keep increasing yield along the 60 year history since IR8. And, and Along the way, the second example came, which was very interesting because IR8, as we know, uh, is a, is a semi-dwarf variety and, and there is a SD1 gene for that. And once IR8 came into being, uh, we started using IR8 for most of our breeding, uh, breeding work. And it became what I call a genomic engine. 
And so we kept on developing new varieties based on IR8 or later on, of course, we got IR62, IR74, mega varieties, but all of them had the IR8 blood because we wanted that particular locus to have uh, the semi-dwarfing status. Interestingly, the semi-dwarf gene SD1 is extremely closely linked to drought susceptibility. So while we were increasing yield, we were breeding for, for drought susceptibility. So that was the second example where, where I realized that you know, continuing to use the same genomic engine may have not just benefits that we are looking at in terms of yield, but certain other problems in some, in some other traits. <clears throat> About six months back, we got another very interesting result. Uh, so Dr. Ines Slamat Lodin, who leads the rice transformation uh, and gene editing laboratory, uh, she has been working for a very long time in trying to increase the grain, uh, the zinc in the grain. And, and there were reasons for her, for her to ask the question, what happens if she changes the promoter region of, the, of a particular gene called OSNAS, which stands for uh, nicotinamide adenine synthase, because that is the gene which she used for increasing uh, the zinc in the grain. And it turned out that when that promoter was disrupted, we got more yield, but less zinc. And so that made another case, a very clear case that along the history of our uh, rice breeding, we have again been breeding to decrease the zinc in the grain. And now, of course, we know in the last decade or so, there have been a number of projects which have tried to increase the amount of zinc and iron in the grain. So we first bred out the zinc from the grain, and now we are trying to breed in back the zinc from the grain. <clears throat> I'm going to spend a, a few slides on, on this one particular uh, aspect that we have recently uh, kind of elaborated. Uh, we, we had some idea about this a few years back, but we have recently elaborated on it. <clears throat> so if you think of a particular uh, substrate called A, which is converted into two products through an enzyme X, the products being B and C, when you silence this particular enzyme X, you would expect that the product A would start accumulating and uh, uh, sorry, the substrate A would start accumulating and the product B and C would go down. Um, this particular enzyme silencing or gene silencing actually has a phenotype and that phenotype is shown here, which is a lot of lateral roots and root hair start coming up. And if you actually see uh, in the wild type and the knockout uh, plants under the wild, uh, under the well watered and drought stress, uh, there are more lateral roots and more root hair when the gene is silenced. When we did this experiment and asked the question, so is A accumulating and B going down? Yes, A was accumulating, but B was not going down. B also started accumulating. And that was interesting because what could be happening is that it is going through another pathway. A is now being converted into A prime. A prime is converted into B prime and C through another enzyme, which is nearly 28 times more active and then B prime gets converted into, back into B. So the reason we are seeing more B accumulation is because of this alternate pathway. But the more interesting thing is these two products, B and C, they are mobile nitrogenous compounds. And while we see the phenotype in terms of what happens to the root, what we also see is that under the knockout of this gene, we get increased yield. And when we look at the yield components, 
the number of panicles remains the same. The number of spikelets per panicle remains the same. The grain weight remains the same. So where is the yield increase coming from? The yield increase is actually coming from more number of spikelets getting filled. And this goes back to a very classic physiological bottleneck, which Dr. Brar actually mentioned to me when I joined Erie, which is that a rice panicle, the upper spikelets get preferentially filled and the lower spikelets do not get uh, filled. Now let's remember B and C are uh, mobile nitrogenous compounds. And so we ask the question that if this is what is happening, can we take these plants and grow them under less nitrogen and see whether or not the yield is compromised? And it turns out that the yield is not compromised. So we are talking here of 40 to 50% reduction in nitrogen application without any compromise on yield. So essentially, um, we have done some field analysis. We have done pot studies. Um, we actually have even got certain other lines from the gene bank, which are sequenced lines, uh, the 3000 genome sequences that we have. <clears throat> And we can actually look at the sequence to say whether or not this gene is silenced in, in a particular accession. And we then actually have the result that we can predict that if it is a non-functional allele, then this particular line should continue to yield without any compromises under less nitrogen. And that is exactly what we have seen. Now, this is just to show that nitrogen production uh, nitrogen use, uh, nitrogen subsidy, it all costs a lot of money. And these are some numbers that I've tried to put together through a calculation, just back of the envelope calculation. And, and the numbers go into billions of dollars. So if we were to save 50% of nitrogen just on rice, uh, we are talking again of billions of dollars. But the more interesting thing is that this particular enzyme is essential. It uses an essential component of life. So this could be present in all other crops and we could be talking of making most of the crops or at least cereals grow under much less nitrogen uh, without any compromise on the yield. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> But more interestingly, <clears throat> um, recently there have been, as Dr. Dar mentioned in his, in his talk, um, there, have, there has been a lot of talk about um, rice being the culprit in uh, methane emissions. So in a country like Vietnam, for example, uh, nearly 50% of the greenhouse gas emissions, they come from the paddy rice cultivation. And that is more than what they emit uh, from their transport sector. One of the uh, solutions which is proffered is that uh, we should start doing direct seeded rice cultivation. And there is enough data to prove that direct seeded rice can reduce methane emissions by 60% or so <clears throat> in the best case scenario. But the problem with DSR is that it increases nitrous oxide emission. And the nitrous oxide is 273 times more toxic to the environment than carbon dioxide. So the greenhouse warming potential of nitrous oxide is 273 times more than carbon dioxide. But if we have such a plant which uses 50% less nitrogen, then we are looking at less reduction or uh, less emission of nitrous oxide. But what is more interesting is that when you have that remobilizable small molecule nitrogen in the plant, it sends out a signal that there is an imbalance between carbon to nitrogen ratio. And the plant physiologists among you would know that a plant always maintains a carbon to nitrogen ratio at a certain level. So if there is more nitrogen, the plant does more photosynthesis, 
and we have seen that very clearly in the in the silenced plants gene silenced plants they are far more green and they do much better photosynthesis so you're actually taking up this this kind of a plant and then using dsr so in one go you're actually reducing carbon dioxide you're reducing methane and you're reducing nitrous oxide there is no other technology in the world that can do this um and, and i think that that kind of speaks for itself in terms of carbon credits as dr dar was mentioning in terms of regenerative agriculture as was mentioned again so the plants are uh, they grow better there's enough nitrogen there's active photosynthesis happening and that can be very useful as as a vigorous plant for dsr now dsr as we all know uses much less water much less labor uh, reduces methane and so it becomes a, a method of choice for rice cultivation um but it has problems with weed and nematodes etc but if we use this kind of a plant then we are giving it the ability to actually grow uh, competitively with the weeds so there are a number of different advantages and if we have these kind of plants we can then start combining it with the different traits uh like the stress tolerance both biotic and abiotic stress tolerance uh, we can start combining it with nutritive traits like low glycemic index traits uh, or high protein and so in one go you're actually looking at really transforming agriculture and so these three examples of um zinc in the grain the drought tolerance or drought susceptibility and uh use of nitrogen this really calls for the new genomic engines which is what you know going back to the title that i that i gave you and essentially it addresses the three major components of what agriculture is suffering from uh, climate resilience is something that we really want in our in our plants we want our crops and cereals especially to be more nutritious and the sustainability issue in terms of nitrogen remobilization now do we have new genomic engines uh and this takes us back to all the world's gene banks um it, at iri for example we have the richest gene bank for rice nearly 132000 uh, accessions of rice um we nearly have 4000 wild accessions of rice uh, which which uh, which uh, go back to 22 wild species we haven't used our gene bank very effectively in fact there is there has been a survey where it has been realized that only 5% of the gene bank accessions have till today been used in breeding experiments 95% of the accessions have not been used for breeding why it goes back to the same example that we got we got totally enamored by the ir8 paradigm and we just start kept breeding with that particular genomic engine but if you go back to the gene bank you have a number of very interesting traits and i think uh, this particular aspect of having two grains per caryopsis has been mentioned in in number of uh, talks not only from iri but uh, i've i've attended some other talks within india uh, which which actually uh, picked up this this trait um but our gene bank manager dr venu prasad has recently been looking at you know what else can the gene bank offer and i found it very interesting when he when he said that you know breeders come to me to ask for genotypes that are resistant or tolerant to different biotic diseases pests or pathogens they come to me to ask for heat tolerant genotypes they come to me to ask for drought tolerant genotypes nobody has ever come to me to ask whether or not the gene bank contains any accessions 
that actually yield more or competitively as the as the elite varieties and when he started looking into that he started finding panicles that were half a meter long and the grains were being completely filled and when he gave me that information i said do you know what the grain quality of these this uh, uh, spikelets or the grains are because maybe yes you have a number of spikelets getting filled up in the grain but they are probably not of the right kind in terms of chalkiness in terms of taste texture in terms of amyl amyloid to amylopectin ratio and so he went back and came back and showed me that the grain quality in this one particular which is to your uh, right uh, you can see for yourself uh, what a rich panicle this is long rich fully filled panicle and the grain quality is perfect so this has been lying there in the gene bank for you know years and years and nobody knows that you can actually get competitive yield without all the 60 years of breeding which is not to say that the breeding should not be done or or hasn't been done well it's just to say that we need to diversify and uh, i've again put up the the picture of dr brar who as i said challenged me when i joined iri in 2008 and he said if you are a molecular biologist biologist of any sort you would actually come up with a way to start filling up the grains at the bottom of the panicle and interestingly we have that answer now not only from the gene bank naturally but we've also found genes uh, and these this is published a gene called ostpr it is a patented gene at iri uh, which increases the yield and one of the one of the uses that we have made of that gene is to try and put it into low glycemic index rice because when we use genes for low glycemic index uh, we lose yield and we then use that particular gene to have more branching in the upper regions of the panicle more spikelets there and so more spikelets getting filled up so essentially we can create and we can find new genomic engines so venu has actually gone ahead uh, and and looked at many accessions of the gene bank and what you see very clearly over here is the number of accessions from the gene bank which are shown in blue are uh, are yielding competitively to the elite varieties which have been shown and if i were to say that that was done at the iri farms and and there was some kind of a bias he sent out nearly 200 lines to vietnam and they did the experiment in their farmers fields and again what we see is that all those accessions yielded more than their check varieties the vietnamese check check varieties so what we are looking at is multiple genomic engines that we can use um he himself venu is a is a very bright scientist uh, he's not just a gene bank manager his 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 terms of reference when he joined as a gene bank manager were that he would be doing 40% of the work towards uh, maintenance of the gene bank activities but 60% of utilizing those gene bank and he's done a fantastic job he's come up with another uh, gene which is called sub2 i think we've all heard of sub1 which is submergence tolerance gene and the sub2 has an additive effect to sub1 and this is from an african variety uh, which interestingly the iri gene bank calls it uh, a a sativa but uh, the african gene bank calls it a glabarima so even if there is a doubt in whether or not it is a, a sativa or a glabarima african rice uh, the fact is that we are getting some very interesting gene from an african uh, accession but in the next one there is no doubt at all because uh, i i was in a collaborative project with with venu and we have looked at all these narica varieties which are african rice varieties from a cross between sativa and glabarima and i can tell you i have never seen a better drought tolerant uh, plant so this is drought starting 45 days after sowing and and the picture was taken 55 days into drought and you can see in the middle 
there is this Nerica line, which is growing extremely, extremely well compared to all the other uh, uh, surrounding plants. So some very interesting genes, et cetera, are around. Dr. Dar again mentioned artificial intelligence, and we all know it is in a way taking over our lives. Um, and again, this is new technology coming in with its own new uh, bane and boon. And its role in agriculture is really turning agriculture into a, into a far more technical uh, profession than it has been today. And a few years later, as was said in the panel discussion also, um, the youth will be coming back to agriculture in a big way. Even right now, there are a number of instances where a number of IIT people are coming, going back into agriculture using their technology knowledge to actually do farming in a far more technically oriented way. So we have to make sure that we use this uh, technology in agriculture effectively. And again, uh, we have used a very high uh, processing power uh, to get the images of seeds, of plants, etc., and be able to predict the phenotypes and the different traits. And again, Venu has done a fantastic job in actually classifying and, and curating this information through uh, artificial intelligence uh, protocols. I want to switch gears just a little bit over here. And I want to quickly say that all these new technologies that kind of keep bombarding us every three to four years. And if it's a not, not a new technology, it's a new technology platform. So gene editing, for example, uh, since the time it was discovered has come up extremely rapidly. And, and people who could do, do gene, genome editing uh, five years back, and if they took a break for two years, if they go back to gene editing now, uh, the scenario has totally changed. So the platforms keep changing. And what I've, I've kept over here on this slide are things like the use of drones. Uh, drones were a fancy toy at one point, uh, except for the military. But now drones are a everyday uh, use thing in agriculture. And it's not just for spraying, it's even for seeding. You can actually have drones that will shoot the seeds into the soil at a particular depth. Um, microbiome, again, it was mentioned in, in relation to, to uh, regenerative agriculture. Uh, genome editing, uh, genomic uh, selection in crop breeding, um, artificial intelligence. So all these, these you know, new technologies or technology platforms, they come on and, and we feel that we, have, we are kind of losing our way and one gets stressed about you know, wanting to keep pace with all these things. So this has been going on at IRI for, for a few years, but also what has happened is a major change in our umbrella organization, the Consultative Group on International Agricultural Research, the CGIR. And over the last three years or so, this continuous process of change uh, and, and the process of uh, change in technologies and restructuring of the organization really uh, kept us going. We did very well, but it was not very focused. Now, what you see here in, in the roadmap of CGIR is, is something again that was mentioned during the panel discussion. You don't see rice, you don't see maize, you don't see wheat, you don't see livestock, but you see the imperatives, the impact that agriculture needs to have. And that includes, uh, of course, nutrition, but it, it includes poverty reduction, livelihoods and jobs. It includes gender, youth, and, and uh, you know, all equity between the marginalized, marginalized populations. And so we have to start looking at our efforts in agriculture in terms of what the impact is but going back to those three, you know, eight, three years uh, where where he continued to do really well in in a certain focused way, but could not really bring things together in what we call the systems approach or the landscape approach. So recently we have reconvened, and we actually realized what is our core business. 
and you might think it is it is a you know uh, not a very difficult thing to figure out what the core business is but you'd be surprised that when uh, an organization is going through that kind of a restructuring and all these technology things are happening uh, it's very difficult to realize what our core business is everybody starts getting interested in climate change everybody starts getting in, interested in artificial intelligence you know microbiome i also want to do microbiome you know every soil scientist wants to do microbiome every pathologist wants to do microbiome every epidemiologist wants to do microbiome because they have dealt with micro microbes right so we sort of literally put it in the center that our core business is breeding agronomy and capacity building but they are they around that core we have the imperatives of climate change and environment change we have imperative of health and nutrition and we have the imperative of farmer welfare and customer care and all those are actually spanned by what we call the evolving digital universe while the inclusivity factor really envelops all of them and as we are scientists uh, it all has to be done very innovatively i think i've taken up my time of nearly 40 minutes but if i can take just five or seven minutes more um, so that entire core business along with its imperatives revolves around what i call the 5d research structure uh, and that those 5ds are captured by demand discovery development dissemination and distinction and by distinction what i mean is impact assessment and so you'd be surprised how smoothly our upstream uh, science of gene discovery is now linked to the breeding pipeline because it is not about saying oh you're doing gene discovery you are into genomics or omics kind of work uh, i don't understand that and so you know you do your stuff and i do my breeding or my do my agronomy what we have actually done is said that if you are doing dsr and you are doing dsr for gene discovery for nematode tolerance or you doing gene discovery for weed competitiveness but there's another person trying to breed lines for dsr while of course there's an agronomist trying to get uh, dsr going in the fields all of them have to be under one flagship everybody sits around the same table and the gene discovery person talks to the policy person talks to the landscape person and the landscape person talks to the breeder to the agronomist and this has made a very big difference we have now got four flagships one of them is dsr uh, and it sounds like it's just one topic but if you look at this slide you realize that it spans uh, gene discovery up to the landscape kind of assessment for dsr which includes all the remote sensing gis etc but it then goes to the policies so it goes back in circle to the socio economics similarly we have nutrition as another flagship and again everybody concerned with nutrition not only somebody who's working on uh, low gi or high protein in the grain but also somebody who's working on asking the question what is a balanced diet in different stratas of the society you know they are all under one flagship they are all talking to each other similarly we have a much more agronomy focused flagship which is climate resilient farming and that again includes everybody uh, in the vertical uh, line our fourth flagship is dissemination which is all about capacity building training uh, knowledge banks but also includes seed systems for example and so it's dissemination per se in terms of uh, adoption and scaling up but it's also dissemination in terms of the knowledge that we have generated and through those four flagships we have some very very interesting results um, and these are all results obtained within the last two and a half years as soon as we started sitting together around the same table we now have ultra low gi which is combined with high protein and it is combined with resistant starch and when i say resistant starch that is different from fiber uh, people try to put uh, dietary fiber and, and resistant starch in the same category but they are technically very different things and in fact there's enough research to show 
that uh, eating fiber will not um, address the gastrointestinal problems that, that uh, prevail, but eating resistant starch will address those because the microbiota or the microbiome of the gut, human gut, changes drastically when you have resistant starch as compared to eating fiber. So we now have a line in the background of Samba Masuri, which, is, which has all these three traits. Ultra low, when I say ultra low, it is about 29, 30 GI. Um, and some of you in the audience might know that when you go that low for GI, uh, the texture of the grain changes so much that you cannot use it as a milled grain. Uh, we then use it for product formulations. We have 18 different product prototypes, uh, pastas, noodles, cookies, mueslis, uh, popped rice, um, ice cream, uh, amazing. Uh, actually, if anyone is interested, you could go to Varanasi. We have the center ISARC, the IRI South Asia Research Center. Uh, and you can get ice cream made from ultra low GI rice. And it's one of the best things you'll have. Um, but it has high protein and it has high resistant starch as well. And all of that has happened after putting uh, the, DS, uh, the nutrition people together. After putting the direct treated rice people together, we have now uh, lines that have been submitted to ICRIP, uh, which are meant for DSR because Remember when people used to do experiments uh, in DSR and, and come back with the results saying that DSR does not work, it, it yields much less. They were doing those experiments with, with varieties that were developed for transplanted conditions. So you could only do that experiment if you had any lines for DSR, perhaps land races. Uh, but now when we do uh, DSR experiments with varieties that are developed for DSR, uh, we see competitive yields to transplanted rice. Um, I want to quickly just mention something about market intelligence. This is one of the initiatives at the CG level that IRI is leading, where the market intelligence, socioeconomic people are very deeply and, and intricately involved with the breeders. And, and this particular initiative uh, has come out with the result that out of the 24 crops that CG deals with, um, rice has the maximum impact factor in terms of addressing poverty, uh, hunger, malnutrition. And that includes wheat and, and maize and any other crops actually. Um, and then we have in, from the Climate Resilient Flagship, we have a number of uh, tools and apps which are very actively being used in Vietnam, for example. We have some other game-changing products in the pipeline, and, and these are from, again, what I call new genomic engines. And these are genomic engines that are made from populations, magic populations, or NAM populations, nested associated mapping populations, or the rails, et cetera. And, and we've got some very good genes for green leaf hopper resistance. We've got some amazing results for high night temperature tolerance. Um, drought tolerance I mentioned to you from Nerica, the same with submergence. We've got amazing results from alien integration lines on a high outcrossing for hybrid rice. And then of course, uh, many new QTLs for, for grain zinc, and these are all still developing. So the summary of the talk is really that, you know, we have to ask the question how useful it is to keep pyramiding things into the old genomic engines. It's not to say that elite by elite crosses are not good, but elite by elite crosses could be useful if we really take the advantage of uh, genomic selection. And again, we are doing that. And that's one way of, of looking at, you know, improving our populations and getting new varieties to replace the old varieties. But we have to go back to the gene banks and try and get new varieties also. Uh, we have to really concentrate on soil, water, land nexus and, and look at things at the landscape level using the systems approach, a transformative systems approach. And a quick example I want to give you about that is that when we used the sub one gene and, and uh, asked the question, uh, what is the advantage of using a sub one gene? We realized that a farmer could be making $192 more uh, using the sub one gene per hectare. 
But the more interesting question was, what does the farmer do with that extra income? And of course, you would end up with a pie chart of, you know, so much into repaying the loan, so much into rebuilding the house. Uh, but 17% of that goes into educating the child. And that is what I call transformative, uh, you know, technology. So in that respect, the sub one gene is an amazing transfer, has an amazing transformative capacity because a child that is educated within two to three years becomes a beacon of knowledge within the family, within the neighborhood, within the village. And so those are the kind of transformative technologies we need to look at. Um, so we continue breeding agronomy and capacity building, but we have to remember our imperatives of climate change, nutrition, and farmer welfare, and make sure that we don't look at socioeconomics as a marginal science. In fact, the market intelligence aspect that I just mentioned to you is now so deeply and intricately connected to our breeding program that we, we think of those socioeconomic scientists as a very integral part of the team. And as I said, uh, as scientists, uh, we have to keep innovating. I want to stop here with a quotation from uh, Ravindranath Tagore. Everything comes to us that belongs to us if we create the capacity to receive it. So the only way we can start doing that is captured by the next quotation, which is you have to be enthusiastic about creating that capacity. And how do you become enthusiastic? As they say, fake it till you make it. You just have to be enthusiastic about whatever you're doing. And, and if you continue to be enthusiastic, you will actually start getting those results. I'll end here with this last bit where I think we need to really ask the question that we might have major issues about who we are, what our capacities are, but we cannot stop going to each other, collaborating and really saying, this is what I want to achieve. And together, I'm sure we can do that. Thank you very much. I think all of you will agree that today we had two very enthusiastic presentations. Dr. Dar, Dr. Kohli, Dr. Barsne, our the, both the secretaries, Dr. Bansal, Dr. Lakra, all the esteemed uh, fellowship of the academy. I can also see Dr. Inubushi. Uh, welcome uh, Dr. Inubushi for this uh, program. Ladies and gentlemen, I think on the eve of Foundation Day of the Academy, you cannot have better presentations compared to the ones, the two rather, which we had today. Both apparently seem to be having a difference. Regenerative agriculture will be looking like something more going back to nature. And of course, the latter one, genome editing, very high in modern science, but then both are there to solve the common problems, common problems of climate change, common problems of water scarcity, drought, common problems of saving nitrogen, reducing emission of greenhouse gases, and so on. Before I talk further, first of all, let me compliment both of them. And also, and also their organizations. I all the time say that the collaboration between CGIAR and ICAR is probably the best example in the whole world that how both the organizations can be benefited. ICRESET is, of course, uh, we are the host country, so it is our organization rather, Dr. Dar. And for IRI, 
if some assessment is made, I don't know that Koli, whether some assessment has been made that which country has got the most benefit out of Iri's work. I think that is going to be India. And ICR and also India as a whole have contributed immensely for the success and achievements of both the organizations, ICRISAT as well as IRI. So through you, I also compliment and acknowledge the contributions what ICRISAT and IRI have made for promoting and what Indian agriculture has achieved today. So my compliments and also thanks to both of you. Incidentally, for now, both of them come from Philippines. Dr. Kohli also comes from Philippines, and of course, uh, Dr. Dar is also from Philippines. But as Dr. Dar himself said that uh, he has got a very long connection, not only 15 years of DG Chriset, but also otherwise. So we consider all of them as Indians rather, working for India and trying to promote Indian agriculture. Friends, Indian agriculture is also facing all the challenges which we mentioned. Climate change is of course the ones. To the morning I mentioned about that this year we are going to have the food grain production of 330 million tons, but then you can never be sure that next year also it is going to be 330 million tons because of climatic uncertainties. And again, all other challenges. So if we have to really make Indian agriculture resilient to climate change and all other uncertainties, probably that uncertainty that next year it may come down, not by one or two million tons, it may come down very drastically. And that's the fear and that's the challenge and that's what we are all looking for. And when you see both regenerative agriculture as well as genome editing tools, probably we need both. We need both so that Indian agriculture will be not only resilient, but also productive, profitable, and of course, sustainable as we progress. Regenerative agriculture is somehow probably is in the core of Indian ethics, philosophy, and Indian agriculture. You quoted Rabindranath Tagore, Dr. Kohli, again around 150 years back, Rabindranath Tagore talked about all these pollutions and everything. He has got a very beautiful poem in Bengali. I'm not going to recite the poem, but then he said that those who are polluting your air, those who are polluting the soil, your means God's air, God's soil, whether you have really forgiven them, whether you have really gave them pardon. So that concern he felt even 150 years back when he saw that all these jungles, forests are being cut down, all these concretes are coming up, all these beautiful agricultural lands are being converted into something else, he could find that yes, point the time is going to come when these things, all this development or so-called development might not be sustainable. And we have to go back to nature, what we say. And again, Mahatma Gandhi said that nature has got everything it can provide you everything to satisfy your need, but not to satisfy your greed. If you become greedy, then nature cannot satisfy you. But if you want to satisfy only your needs, nature has got plenty of everything. Probably besides satisfying our need, we have also become greedy actually. Greedy more and more and more and that's how we have destroyed many of these things. We have polluted air, we have destroyed water bodies, and of course, all these greenhouse gases, whether it is methane, nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide, and so on. And therefore, the solution should also come from, both of you talked about carbon farming, giving back to nature. Actually, you know, this is also the first law of agriculture, even by long back, which we call as law of restitution. Law of restitution says that whatever you are taking from soil, you have to give it back to soil. You have to restitute it if you really want to make it sustainable. And that's what regenerative agriculture talks about. And also through all these modern technologies, including genome editing, drought, and all kinds of things we are trying to do. So Dr. Dar and Dr. Kohli, on behalf of 
the whole fellowship of this esteemed academy, National Academy of Agricultural Sciences. I thank both of you. I compliment both of you and I congratulate both of you for delivering both excellent talks, very enthusiastic talk and the kind of transformation which you saw Dr. Kohli about CGIER. It is good that now ICRISAT is also going to join one CGIER. So now all of you are going to be together and the kind of transformation what one CGIER has shown the whole world, probably many other organizations, including ICER, we also need to have some kind of change in our direction, change in our structure, reorganization or whatever name you give so that the whole food system can be addressed. All the challenges of modern times can be addressed and Indian agriculture and also in a way global agriculture could be really sustainable, really be productive, really be profitable. And of course, the nature will not be harmed. Since time immemorial, people have talked about prakriti and pragati. Those are two Hindi words, Dr. Dar. Prakriti is nature and pragati is progress or development. Both this prakriti and pragati should go hand in hand. They should not divorce from each other. If you divorce them, then you are going to fall into the problem. But if you can really bring them together, progress as well as take care of nature. And that's what we all should be doing. Once again, thank both of you and thank all of you for being here to be witness of these two excellent presentations. Thank you very much. Jai Hind. Well, friends, I'm sure you will agree with me that for me, it was actually after a very long time that I had such a nice, wonderful experience of listening presentations of so very important issues, including today, the special evening lectures by two stalwarts talking on different aspects has already been mentioned. I don't want to go into the details of it, but well, I'm here to propose a word of thanks. Dr. Lakra, as you all know, tomorrow we have AGM, it's totally busy there. So word of thanks, I'd be very happy, first of all, to again, thank enough our honorable president to come up with this idea, as was also mentioned while welcoming you all in, in the morning, that we had these two wonderful panel discussions. And today we had this evening, what could be a better evening than this for the scientific fraternity and that to all esteemed fellowship of the National Academy of Agricultural Sciences, that we had an opportunity to listening to these great presentations. So for this, before I thank the speakers themselves, I think it's my duty on behalf of the Academy, on behalf of all of you, to thank our honorable president to come up with this idea and you know, having these organized you know, the whole day in such a manner you know, that I'm sure it will go a long way in giving us enough food for thought how we can really transform ourselves into different kinds of technologies for sustainable agriculture and sustainable development in our country. So we are very thankful to you, sir, and we continue getting our, all the guidance from you, I'm sure, in the future. Of course, I'm very thankful to both the esteemed speakers uh, who found time and who really speaking, I think, made enough effort to prepare these wonderful presentations. I can see that the presentations were so elaborate and, and the slides were excellent. And of course, the message given as has already been you know, summarized by our honorable president was again excellent. So I'm very thankful to both you, Dr. William Dar, and to also Dr. Ajay Kohli. Dr. Ajay Kohli made a presentation. I'm sure I would like to talk to him a little more later about the nitrogen metabolism. It was wonderful. And of course, I'm very thankful to all the esteemed fellows and the fellowship present here who have acted in different capacities as members of the executive council and also as, as conveners of the sectional committee or, or the members of the sectional committee that we found enough merit in those who are present here today. Dr. William Dar is a foreign fellow, Dr. Pravasi, Dr. Ajay Kohli is a Pravasi fellow. We have Dr. Karim Meridia. In fact, he has also joined from, from USA, you know, Dr. Karim Meridia is a Pravasi fellow. We have a friend from Japan who is also another you know, foreign fellow. So we have out of five, four present today, in fact, you know, for, for getting, you know, charged by the Honorable President tomorrow, uh, you know, for, for, and they will be receiving their, their, their fellowship. So it's really speaking, um, my thanks to the entire fellowship, the whole academy, and so that we are able to really speaking, you know, have more such occasions of uh, talking science and science 
and all for the welfare of farmers ultimately. And also, of course, for the welfare and for the sustainability of, of the environment as a whole, as has been mentioned. So with this, without taking away much time of you, now it's the dinner time. Once again, I thank you all for here, for being here throughout the day and also giving your excellent input. And we will now further interact. And I invite you all, thanking you again, all of you, and invite you again all for, for the dinner. And thanks to Dr. Professor Rajiv Varshne. Thanks to also Dr. Latra, who is not here. But Dr. Rajiv Varshne, thank you again. You again also came from all the Australia to participate in this. So we are enriched, really speaking, this time quite a lot with, with this presentation and the presence of all you all. So thank you very much, friends. And I request you, invite you for dinner and enjoy and have some more interaction with the speakers. Thank you very much. Once again, all of you, please.